Good morning, good morning, good morning. So we have a really important and impactful panel today, um, this morning for you on a topic that I think is of interest to a wide range of people, not just because it deals with technology, but because it deals with things that sustain our place in this world, and that is climate, climate and the environment. So this panel looks at the intersection of climate and the environment, not only looking at technology as possible solutions, but also as aggravating factors for our current crisis related to energy, the implications of the use of resources and extraction, and the possible implications for us as people who live in the United States and around the world. And so this panel will discuss some of these issues. We hope to um, elicit some possibilities and takeaways for you. And I also want to admonish you to um, formulate perhaps a question or two if you have them. So I want to start off with this really great panel with having each of our panelists introduce themselves as well as to talk about their areas of focus and how it relates to climate, climate action, and the environment. So I'll set us up first with Dr. Lisa Frazier. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you, Jasmine. Uh, Dr. Lisa Frazier, I am um, a researcher, senior research scientist at the Battelle Center for Science, Engineering, and Public Policy at The Ohio State University, uh, John Glenn College of Public Affairs. Um, so I come to this uh, topic um, sort of as an imposter of some sort in that my background is actually in epidemiology and public health um, and so the sort of broad social determinants of health. And um, what we know very clearly from all of the evidence is that climate change um, and matters of climate resilience have direct impacts on human health and have disproportionately negative impacts on uh, marginalized communities of various kinds. And so that's kind of the, the pathway I come to, um, but also that human health is an incredibly important input into realizing climate resilience and taking action against um, the negative effects of climate change. Uh, and that's really all you asked for, right? All right, good, Gordon. Um, good morning, uh, I'm Gordon Douglas. I'm an Associate Professor of Urban and Regional Planning here at SJSU. I'm also the Director of our Institute for Metropolitan Studies. Um, I also come at this from, I suppose, not a climate science uh, background. I'm a sociologist by training and degree, um, and uh, sort of erstwhile geographer as well. Um, and But I've worked in this space kind of at the intersection of urban planning and development and uh, climate and hazard and disaster um, for, uh, I guess, on and off, I suppose I would say, for the last uh, 10 plus years. Um, really coming to it first through uh, New York's experience of Hurricane Sandy, where I lived at the time uh, and had the, the privilege to work um, for a Rockefeller-funded kind of resiliency program at NYU after, um, after Sandy. And uh, it eventually brought that out here to the West Coast when I, when I left NYU and came to SJSU. Um, we, we created something called uh, the Resilient by Design University that was a, an effort to draw um, academic and professional leaders together into um, sort of casual classroom settings to really think hard about these resiliency challenges um, in both New York and in the Bay Area. Um, and so that's kind of where my, my work has been. I, I, my, I really connect the climate to the climate questions, again, really through these questions of urban development and their impacts on uh, communities, neighborhoods, um, and, and these kind of larger uh, question, like, similar to what Lisa said, questions of social justice and equity um, a, in our built environment. Um, so currently looking at a lot of that here in the Bay Area, especially with our unhoused communities and um, other lower income people who are most uh, vulnerable in many ways to disaster, including those we face here from flooding to fire to other sorts of uh, climate related challenges. So. Looking forward to talking about it. This is Tess. 
Well, thank you very much. I'm California State Senator Dave Cortese. I represent uh, this area, of about a million people um, in this area. About 80% of my district is, is San Jose, and that's just shifted a little bit in the last election um, to include uh, what we call South County, Gilroy, um, San Martin, and Morgan Hill as well. Um, very happy to be here. I've been a lifer in, in this area, going all the way back to the agricultural days uh, where my, my family was involved uh, in that business in, in much of this area, as was I. I became a member of the San Jose City Council at 45 years old, um, and six years later, two years before I was termed out, San Jose adopted um, one of the first climate action plans of any big city in, in America, and it, it was a big deal. Just a couple years before, as the vice mayor of the city, I had asked that we establish one of our policy committees um, as a climate committee, as a, as a green committee, and, and dedicate that work, really create an outlet for you know, all the good work that was sort of stored in people's heads already at that time, and, and get that out on paper and get it into action. I got to the Board of Supervisors, where I spent 12 years um, right after that, and I think 2008 through uh, 2020, when I got there, there was not one solar installation on any county property in this county, in Silicon Valley, where the county had over 700 parcels of property, um, and not to mention its parking lots and everything else. So um, we, uh, uh, a gentleman who uh, taught here for a number of years, I don't know if he still does, Ken Yeager was my colleague on the Board of Supervisors, and we put together a, a climate action plan for the county and started moving down the road to deal with everything from energy storage to a, a lot of solar, f four major solar farm installations in the county, and, and, so, and a lot of what we had learned from the city, frankly. Um, I got to the Senate in 2020, and as with most issue areas that I learned about and dealt with here or tried to lead on here in Santa Clara County, um, climate became one of those. My first three bills, December, 7th of 2020 were climate bills. Um, and they were, they were decarbonization bills. I was really trying to focus on building decarbonization, which we might talk about later in terms of just the challenges of the politics of that. Um, but uh, around that time, um, I had also become a champion for what a lot of us call climate restoration, uh, regardless of what we're doing to, to tackle fossil fuels and uh, and reduce our dependence on them or eradicate them at some point as much as we can. Um, there's an argument, especially here in Silicon Valley, that we should be doing everything we can, including technological uh, innovation, to, to try to get carbon out of the atmosphere to, to restore uh, levels uh, to pre-industrial periods. So I'm for that. I spoke at the United Nations on that um, a few years ago. And um, that's kind of my background in a nutshell in, in, in terms of um, where my interests have, have been in terms of climate. Thank you. Thank you all. And so we talk about climate, particularly climate action or action to sustain the environment, save the environment, some may say. Um, there's a lot of hype surrounding the use of artificial intelligence as a possible solution for mitigating the, you know, issues we're having <laughs> with the environment, so to speak. What can AI do and what can it not do? And what are the implications of using artificial intelligence broadly defined, so the big tent umbrella as of artificial intelligence systems for helping with climate emergencies? AI is not going to save us. Um, I would just say AI is like any other piece of technology um, or pieces of technology. It is really a set of technologies, right? Um, those of you who know me and have heard me talk about literally anything before have heard me say Kranzberg, Kranzberg's first law of technology is technology is neither good nor bad nor is it neutral. Same thing here. So AI can be used as a tool for good. AI can be used as a tool for not good. AI can be used as both simultaneously, but it's the humans that do the doing, and 
until, you know, it's not, maybe, I don't know. Um, <laughs> and so it could be deployed for various purposes that would be useful for um, climate action, cl climate resilience, but um, it's not all sunshine and roses. And I would just pause there and see if the gentleman have anything to say. I, <clears throat> so um, I don't disagree with, you know, some of the broad statements about um, the pluses and, and minuses that we'll see with AI in the future. At the legislative level, we're still at that early stage where a lot of legislators in, you know, I know this is public and I would say this uh, on the floor or in a committee, a, a lot of legislators are wanting to be associated with AI one way or the other. And so we've, we're in that early stage where you see all these bills kind of thrown up against the wall and some of them are just broadly talking about AI as if it's it's a monolithic thing, as, as opposed to, you know, do we have concerns about robotic surgery? Do we have concerns about robotic taxis? Do we have concerns about uh, anything else under the sun? Uh, obviously, uh, the Writers Guild down in Hollywood had severe concerns about uh, what's going on there. Journalists have severe concerns about critical concerns about deep fakes. So, what should the legislature be doing? Number one. And I wonder if the legislature, which was designed 200 years ago, is really equipped in its, in its schedule, <laughs> in its sequence of, of, of requirements in terms of getting a bill to the governor's desk, if we can move quickly enough where there is need and there will be need. Um, you know, we bring bills here over the next, you know, starting in December, January, February, we won't know whether or not there are laws until next October and then they don't take effect until it'll be 2026. How much more is gonna happen in AI between now and if and when those bills get signed and then what are they gonna be about? So that, that's just, a, that's just a, an issue that probably belongs more in a political science you know, classroom to discuss. You know, are our institutions able to keep up anymore? I think the value of AI in terms of things like climate is from my perspective as a legislature is to the extent AI can be used for good to map, uh, to gather data, you know, to get to cause and effect, uh, you know, almost like the old failure analysis type of thing. If you can expedite that kind of work with AI, uh, I was told recently by a student, and it might have been a San Jose State student, but that DWR, Department of Water Resources, has over 500 databases that it's pulling from. Um, almost none of which are available to students or the general public, um, and certainly not on any kind of a dashboard. If AI could do that, you know, put all of that data into a dashboard much more quickly than it would take us to do using traditional and conventional methods, um, there's probably something there in terms of, of, of value, in terms of, of the climate movement, um, and people who are working in that movement might, might be able to tap and make good use of that information. So you could, now what, what would the legislature do? You know, those it, agencies like, like CARB, like the Air Resources uh, folks are, are executive agencies under the governor. But if the governor is not prioritizing that for whatever reason amongst his 10,000 priorities, the legislature often plays the role of, of directing, you know, charting a course uh, for those kind of things to happen and appropriating the money to make sure it happens. So I think as we refine our approach from throwing things up against the wall to really figuring out more surgically how we can use some of these tools. Um, you, you might see us accidentally <laughs> stumble across, you know, expediting um, some, some new tools uh, that can be used by folks in academia and elsewhere uh, to get us to where we're going. So, yeah, I'm no expert on artificial, artificial intelligence or it's uh, sort of, you know, trajectory um, that, we, uh, that we could speculate about. But I, I do think even right now, I mean, we can imagine how higher computing technology, including AI, certainly can help with things that we really need to do better, like modeling floods, modeling fires, mod modeling vulnerability. Um, but the other thing is, I, you know, to, to sort of what, what Lisa was saying, I think it's about how these technologies can improve the daily ability of people to do things better, right? Uh, and so from a planning perspective, what we always think about uh, is how to make things like community engagement and participation in these planning processes um, better, realer, more authentic, more meaningful. 
and that's been a challenge for half a century uh, or more, but I do think that technology, and I would you know, certain, some AI certainly has this potential too, can potentially help um, communities, especially those that don't always have the voice or the political power to get things done uh, that they need, and so they can be maybe left behind in, say, a resiliency planning process at a regional or statewide level, um, despite their vulnerability. Uh, if it can enhance their ability to participate and have their voice heard, um, so that when we're doing our disaster preparedness and our resiliency planning, those communities that we might, uh, that it might be too easy not to hear from, um, can be heard from. And the example I'll give is, is not about AI, but it is about recent technology. So like Wi-Fi is not gonna save anybody from climate change either, right? But um, a wonderful example that, that I always point to was uh, this wireless mesh network that was developed in, in Red Hook, Brooklyn. Um, by the Red Hook Initiative and a bunch of wonderful people uh, started in the public housing uh, projects there in Red Hook uh, prior to Hurricane Sandy, but was in its, its infancy when the hurricane struck um, and only grew and became a real source of neighborhood organizing, uh, and I would say a catalyst maybe for neighborhood organizing and recovery, even in, in some of the hardest hit uh, areas after Hurricane Sandy. So you can imagine, and that's just why access to wireless internet, right? So maybe AI, there's a, an analog for that in, in enabling people to both plan and recover um, from disasters or from the, the kind of more amorphous threat of, of climate change and challenges. Great. So when we're thinking about the use of technology for um, mapping, for drawing from databases, for health risks, for environmental risks or assessing risks, um, AI and other technologies are data intensive and data requires energy and energy intensive and there's a real movement to place data centers in various locations and those data centers take a lot of resources including energy, including water and other um, really important resources from a community. But at the same time, on the other side, they offer workforce incentives, right, for local municipalities and states to allow them to be developed. And so my question is, what do states and local municipalities need to be thinking about from a policy perspective? When we look at this intersection of these very energy intensive jobs or, or at least the pers perspective of jobs um, for local municipalities, but at the same time, those spaces are affecting climate, affecting the environment. This one might make sense for me to start. So I, I authored a bill last year that died um, in effect on the last day of session on the assembly forum in the Senate, of course, I think the number was 1298, SB 1298, but um, it could be off. I apologize if you try to Google that, it comes up wrong. But it was a, it was a bill that, was, uh, that we were asked to, to run on behalf of Silicon Valley Leadership Group and others right here because there's currently a 1.6% vacancy in data centers in the state of California. It's very low. If you were, if that was a, a vacancy factor in, in commercial office space or residential, you would consider it to be at basically zero, 100% occupied. Um, to give you an idea of, of what that means, so um, and data centers don't go up quickly because the regulatory scheme involves a, a lengthy application process that goes through the California Energy Commission. So the bill attempted to allow these data centers to to bump up. 50 megawatts, no more than that, um, and you know, kind of free up some space in an in an expedited way. It would still go through the CEC, uh, but in um, in a shortened process that the, that they've used for data centers 100 megawatts or less. So here's what we ran into, and it really became part of the stumbling block at, at the end of the day on the bill. Um, diesel gener backup generators. So data centers operate except for 0.07% of the time on electrical power. But when we have you know, one of these shutdowns um, and those data centers are running 
stuff that's critical to us, of course, they go like a hospital would. They would go directly to, to diesel. Well, CARB came in and said, that's not okay. Get rid of the diesel and we'll be fine with the bill. Well, CARB also had all of us commit to get rid of diesel by 2033, not 2024. So we were, you know, wait a minute, is, is that even realistic? And what, do, what is the backup then? Um, there's not batteries that are that large that have that kind of capacity, you know, to keep up with that kind of megawatt uh, need. Um, but to your earlier, to your opening point, the reason I ran the bill is not because I'm, I'm, you know, anti anti climate in any way, shape, or form, or pro diesel. But uh, we we have a, a huge problem if we are stuck, you know, in terms of data center expansion. The second thing that you know runs afoul of all this. That, interestingly, nobody mentioned in any committee went through six or seven committees and, and four votes and everything else was, okay, so we bump at 50 megawatts per, you know, per data center, where's that power gonna come from? Our, there's a reason that we extended uh, Diablo Canyon uh, two years ago and probably we'll have to extend it again, I'm guessing, is because it's very clear if you chart it out that right now at least that all the solar and wind power that you could manage to, to um, implement uh, over the next few years is not enough to present to prevent a collapse of, of the grid and, and I don't really think data centers are entirely factored into that um, so it, it's a big problem it's a big problem that you know the intersectionality you know gets as 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 mundane but as important to diesel as diesel backup generators and then as extreme if you want to look at the, the bigger picture is where the hell is this power going to come from um, and then layer on, you know, EV infrastructure and a whole bunch of other things we haven't talked about yet. So these are huge, huge issues that have barely been grappled with in the legislature and certainly not resolved. So, um, Jasmine, I mean, everybody's here heard me talk about this, but um, something that states and cities, municipalities, when they agree to bring um, data centers and com computational power, broadly speaking, to their communities, there should be environmental impact assessments. Sometimes in the state of Ohio, I don't know how other states handle these, um, sometimes those are required, but sometimes they are not. I think that's a state level decision for, in most cases. Um, sometimes environmental impact assessments are done under the auspices of a health impact assessment because again, that connection between environmental impact and health impact is linked quite tightly. Um, but that's not always done. So a local example that, that they've all heard me talk about is that in central Ohio, um, we are evidently working on making ourselves the Silicon Heartland. This is, this is an aspiration of the state of Ohio, central Ohio. So um, in the last two years, we've had a proliferation of data centers and uh, associated facilities. Um, an Intel semiconductor fab, it's actually gonna be a set of 11 fabs. Amazon Web Services, we have, I think, now four data centers, two built and two under um, construction. We have a Honda battery uh, fabrication manufacturing center for battery-powered vehicles. We have a Google, two da Google data centers. We have uh, a Meta data center, and Microsoft just announced last month that they're investing $420 million in a data center in the same area, New Albany, which is suburban um, Columbus. Why New Albany? Why the suburbs? Because the city of Columbus has much tighter regulations. They require environmental impact assessment. Uh, there's also the land issue, it being more expensive land and less obvious where these things would go. But it's a non-trivial policy decision on the part of the municipal government of the city of Columbus to say, you know, these, building these facilities has serious environmental and health impact on our population. It also has serious equity considerations because where are those centers going to be built? and the water that is required to cool them, where does that come from? And where does that go <laughs> when it becomes wastewater? These are important considerations. The city of New Al Albany has made a calculation, more or less, to paint with a broad brush, to say the trade-off on economic impact for us 
workforce development, but also economic impact that we get to be the heart of the Silicon heartland um, is, is a trade-off that they have made. And I think that one of the things that keeps coming up already this morning is that public interest technology is not a piece of technology, but the question for us is how do we make any technology a piece of technology that serves the public interest? And public policy is technology. It is social technology. It is governance technology. It is institutional technology. So how do you make not just the data centers that do provide jobs, that do provide economic advancement in some regard, how do we make those not just engines of technology and employment, but also engines of public interest? And par a big part of that calculus are the trade-offs that are inherent in making those decisions. Can I just add something on a, so here, I mean, just since we're here in San Jose, the majority, I believe the majority of data centers in California, but certainly in Northern California, are all centered in the little city of Santa Clara, California. And, um, and that's because many years ago they started a thing, their own power company, um, which was a prudent decision. It helped them to diversify their, their revenue portfolio like no other city around here has been able to do. Um, but they're also able to undercut um, utility rates or uh, energy rates, which means that from all over California, folks who wanted to build data centers came here, came to Santa Clara actually, um, not because, in part because it, it's helpful to be like most tech cottage industries close by to where all the action is, where the driving industries are, but more importantly just because uh, it's a P&L you know, balance sheet exercise, why would we want to be in San Jose, for example, instead of right across the street in Santa Clara where we can um, get power five or 10% cheaper. Um, so those, as usual, on the corporate side, you know, I'm a capitalist, but on the corporate side, if you leave things unregulated, um, P&L is going, going to, to drive everything. And, and that up till now, that's just what's happened almost while people haven't been paying attention. So thinking about the implications of climate change, uh, and one of those is uh, migration, climate migration and climate refugees based on the significant impacts of things like floods and fires, but also hurricanes. I, I live in the state of Florida, and we've, been, we've gotten some good ones uh, in the past couple of months. Uh, but hurricanes are normal maybe not the strength of the hurricanes um, that we're seeing now. And so how can cities, municipalities, states prepare for the increase, possible increase of migration because of climate, because of environments? And how can tech possibly be a tool? And, and let me throw in a wrinkle to that question. What do we do with the movement of people into areas that were traditionally the places for marginalized and uh, vulnerable populations. I'm gonna give you the, the example of Miami where Overtown was for, was for black people and nobody else lived there because it was, it was black people there and it was underserved, under-resourced. But as the coast starts to erode, more people are coming to Overtown or wanting to develop in Overtown. One, it's Overtown, so it's higher than sea level. Um, and so what does that do for populations who have existed in these areas that are now desirable because of climate change? And what are the implications for technology in that nexus as well? Yeah, so, yeah, it's a really, a really good question. And it's, you know, of course, we think often about climate migration and climate refugees at this kind of global scale. Um, but I think we really see it even, even locally, right, with um, people being displaced by, by fires and floods um, and these really important real questions about do we then rebuild in those places or do we encourage what, uh, you know, sometimes called like managed retreat from the coast or we have development limits uh, in parts of California now to try to discourage um, development in the in the uh, at the 
fire prone kind of uh, wildland urban interface. Um, but that, of course, raises a whole bunch of questions for, for folks who don't have an option easily for somewhere else to go, right? And, um, and we've seen in, for instance, uh, in, in Napa County, in the city of Napa even, uh, after the fires there in 2015, uh, a massive decline in, like if you look at the, the data, in the poverty rate up there, right? And it's not that, uh, you know, Napa just got richer, it's that a lot of the places that burned in those fires, and same thing again a few years later in Santa Rosa, the, the areas that tend, that, that have, have burned, um, have been lower income, either rural areas or areas um, on the kind of the outskirts of Santa Rosa in that case, et cetera, and areas where a lot of lower income people lived and could not afford to rebuild, right, because of the price of land, because of the uh, high cost of living in these regions. And so you have something like fire inducing gentrification, essentially, right, where, where some folks can afford to, to stay uh, and rebuild, et cetera, and we saw it after Sandy too, right? Some folks are in a good position to either move the, the generator out of the basement and up to the top of a luxury building, or uh, the emergency generator, that is, um, or to elevate their home on the coast, or, or et cetera, and other folks who, who can't afford to rebuild, and they're, they're, uh, they have waterfront property that is quickly becoming underwater property, right? Um, so we see those kinds of, of, of things causing sort of migration, right, and f causing really displacement. Um, and at the same time, to the question of technology, um, I think we've already seen what uh, some of the better examples to me of kind of public interest technology at a fairly basic level again, but enabling, for instance, citizen-driven uh, flood mapping projects. My, my friend uh, Liz Koslov down at UCLA has done a ton of really great work on uh, com kind of community mapping um, around flood insurance maps and efforts by communities to have a say in kind of in, in these uh, questions that are now really uh, on everybody's mind here in California around fire maps, right? Uh, and where insurance is just being dropped across the board in many cases um, because of the threat of fire. So maybe through kind of the sort of geospatial data analysis that, that our students in planning are learning and doing on a daily basis, we might be able to allow community members um, to, to participate and again have a voice in those uh, discussions about things like insurance and vulnerability to fire and floods, um, and, and at the very least, just to make those uh, analyses as as delicate and sophisticated as they as they certainly need to be. But um, yeah, I don't I don't know that the technology can uh, you know save us from these from from the fire <laughs> challenges, right, or from the flooding challenges. Um, but again, I think it can play a really important role in how we understand these things at a really nuanced level and can figure out what's, uh, what's safe and possible. So I think um, I'm gonna answer this in a slightly different way, which is, but it's, it dovetails with what Gordon is saying, is that um, technology and specifically sort of uh, data science techniques, geospatial uh, mapping techniques, computational modeling simulation are incredibly powerful tools for people, not just data nerds, but for um, citizens to engage with the complexities of the problems with which we are faced. And so, and there's no bigger wicked problem um, than climate change. There just isn't, that's the one. And so it's a wonderful way to engage students. You know, I do a lot of work with students, and I'm sure many of you do too. Um, it's a wonderful way to engage with students, but it's also a wonderful way to engage with citizens on, do these feel like insurmountable, insurmountable problems to you? They are. <laughs> we get, that's by definition what a wicked problem is. But we do now, computationally, because of our data tools, because of our data technology, we have tools to help understand the complexities and the complex dynamics of how these problems unfold. And so not just the dynamics of climate change from a climate science perspective, but from a social perspective, right? What does a pattern of climate um, migration look like for your community? How do you engage with that? Um, what does that mean if your particular concern is education? Well, guess what? You know, I live in the Midwest. How many of you live in flyover states? Oh, come on now. I know you out there, all right. Uh, 
some of us, our, our, our communities are going to be and already are affected by this deeply, and it changes everything. It changes um, school systems, it changes tax bases, it changes economies, broadly speaking. Um, it certainly changes demographics and representation in, in local and state governments. And so those are big, hairy problems, but you can't deal with those in traditional, with traditional data techniques, right? You need computational techniques, you need simulation techniques, you need geospatial techniques to help you understand the complexities of those problems. And I think it does actually help demystify and reduce the fear, which I find to be a particularly important point right now in this moment, that these are changes that are coming, these are changes that are here, but you are not powerless as a, as a citizen to engage with what that change looks like. And I think that's one way in which sort of data technologies in particular are super powerful potentially with that, that story of, of uh, migration. The, the issue, the intersectionality of labor and equity is, is something that in California has received surprisingly little attention. Um, if you compare what California does, for example, with stimulus money to um, what the Biden administration set forth as guidelines for what we should be doing in terms of labor and equity, um, he'd, I think you'd be amazed, especially those, those of us that are from the state and kind of just automatically think we're, we're leading the world in terms of labor and equity issues. We're not. Um, and, and this is gonna get worse to the question, when you have massive lithium battery production that's gonna go on in the Salton Sea and a very poor population there, you're gonna get more uh, displacement, um, you're going to get, uh, and or, uh, you're going to get people who, industries who got that money um, passed through from the state of California without the state putting labor and equity standards on that money and requiring them to pay um, quality wages um, to, to require local hire for those quality wages, that's what people are gonna get pushed out again and that whole area will become gentrified and it won't, it won't resemble you know, what we see now. And some people, won't say who, will probably say, victory, look what we did to the Salton Sea area. We turned it into you know, the, the Las Vegas of, uh, of lithium batteries. Um, so there's a small, I'll, I'll conclude here, there's a, you'll be, I think some of you will be happy to know that four of us created a labor equity caucus in the Senate where we had neither before. Um, Senator DeRazo and Senator Small Cuevas from Los Angeles, um, Senator Lena Gonzalez, our majority leader from Long Beach, and then myself, I'm the only Northern California person in, in that. And we've already run one successful bill, SB 150, and we're trying to add on to that now to require that, that not just the, the, the taking of stimulus money for capital projects needs to have labor and equity um, standards attached to it, conditions attached to it, but also ongoing manufacturing dollars that come through those plants you know, should also abide by those kinds of, of standards. Um, it's something we see here locally a lot, having served here, as I said earlier, um, through redevelopment policies, city investment, county investment, these local governments in this part of Northern California, they attach labor and equity standards to just about everything, no matter what. It, it, one would argue it hasn't helped that much because we also have a large disparity of, 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 of incomes of anywhere in the world, uh, or at least anywhere in the United States, I should say. But, um, but it's an important tool, and it's, it's to turn your head away from that and just say, hey, we're gonna put $30, million, $30 billion, which we did two years ago, into climate investment and not attach labor and equity standards to one dime of it is not creating a California for all. That's my argument, and that's the argument of our little caucus. So we've only been able to not even scratch the surface in thinking about climate, climate action, public interest technology, and policy, which has been a, a thread throughout this entire conversation. But if we wanted to leave you with a, if you wanted to leave the audience with a quick, quick 20 second um, thing that they should focus on or take away from this panel, like a, a path of action, what would that be for each of you?
first of all, thank you for doing this and keep doing this. That would be number one on my list. I mean, variations of this, uh, build on this. From the legislative perspective only, um, know that one thing technology has done is made it super easy um, to, to get your point across or to get your group's point across through legislative portals now without having to go to Sacramento or take a bus ride up there with a bunch of other people. That's effective too. But um, believe me, uh, to close up my 20 seconds, before we vote on anything, all of us are scrolling down to see who's the support, who's the opposition. I see San Jose State on anything, uh, for example, just to be very uh, parochial here, I'm gonna pause and say, what the hell are they asking me to do? And that's true of 120 legislators up and down the state. So don't give up on that, at least here in California. Can't speak to Congress, but California, that'll, that'll work a lot of the time. Thank you. Uh, I'll just say something that I think has been implied by what else I've said, but uh, there's a, the, the hope for all this stuff to me, perhaps as a planning scholar and a, and a sociologist, but is um, the ability to get more people's voices heard and, the, and more folks who, you know, uh, exist in, in uh, underpriv underprivileged or, or disempowered positions in terms of our political system and is, is specifically our planning system um, is, is really the, that's where the potential lies in, in new technology. Um, and I think of like citizen science initiatives and uh, community meetings being held online and it's very simple technological things. And I think of a student of mine during the pandemic who was so excited that all of a sudden she could be at like four or five different community meetings as an activist all across Santa Clara County because they were all online, right? She didn't have to take transit, you know, try, try to take the VTA light rail from Mountain View to East San Jose or wherever else to try to attend all these meetings. And that goes back to this old, you know, we don't talk as much about the digital divide anymore. Um, it, because you know everybody's got a cell phone, a smartphone in their pocket, but um, but it does really matter. And I think getting this sort of like making sure that access to this technology is equitable and that that it we don't uh, continue to just kind of lose the voices of of those who we don't always hear is is the most exciting thing. And that's as important in climate as as anywhere else. One piece of advice, Jasmine, um, if you work with students. My advice is to use um, climate change and climate action as an illustrative case of public interest technology. Use it as an inroads to talk about wicked problems, to talk about systems change, and to talk about the use of technologies, broadly speaking, for public interest purposes. It's a beautiful door. And especially this generation of students right now is very concerned about it. Um, broadly, and it's a great door to, to get um, start that discussion with them. If your area is primarily res research, um, climate change has implications for both the, per the development of technology and the deployment of technology. Um, as I said, I think about climate action, um, climate change, and health. My guess is if you think about your particular area of research, there's that connection as well. So providing those, those cases within the context of your research and connections in the literature of the implications of your research for um, the climate picture, I think is really useful and helps um, build the case for the relevance of your research to the, to the broader issue. If you're a funder, fund people doing that. That's it. Thank you, thank you all. Please join me in thanking our panel.